Well, good morning to everyone, and we trust we're good on a very wet morning. But anyway, that's the way it is. We're going to read from the hymn 36. 36. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, to keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God, the Father now be given, the Son and him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God whom earth and heaven adore, for so it was, is now, and shall be ever more. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, as we gather in your holy presence this morning, we acknowledge that all that we are, all that we have, everything that we enjoy, every blessing that we know is from our God and our Heavenly Father. We thank you and we praise you and we bless you that it's in you that we live and move and have our being. And we owe no God afresh this morning our need of you. The Lord Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. It's absolutely true. We need you, O oh God. We need your blessing. We need your grace. We need your loving kindness and your tender mercies in our life. O oh Lord, remember us, we pray. Come to us today. Meet with us in the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask, and cause your face to shine upon us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we're back to the children's talk there this morning. And we've been looking at these different books of the Bible. And we've made our way through a whole list of them, haven't we? And we came last Sunday morning to the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is all about wisdom. And we made um, a great um, play of the fact that wisdom is not the same as being clever. A lot of people think that if they're clever, they're wise. But those are two different things. And you can do all your sums, and we want you to do your sums. We want you to learn your spellings. But that's not the same as being wise. And in fact, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Where does wisdom begin? And the answer is that wisdom begins in the fear of God. To know God, to know that God is, to know that God is one that we need to revere. We need to walk with him knowing that he's far greater than us. We're just his creatures. And we need to walk in the fear of God. But well, I want to come this morning then to the next book. And I doubt, I don't know, do you know what the next book is, Samuel? Have you been studying that after Proverbs? Maybe not. Daniel, do you know? No, it's quite a mouthful. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, okay? And it's a very important book. It's one that people perhaps think is very hard to understand, but it's a very important book. We looked at it in church, but it's probably some years ago now. And I suppose the first thing that I need to say about the book of Ecclesiastes is that it's written by the same person as, for the most part, the book of Proverbs. So the main writer of the book of Proverbs is, who was the main writer of Proverbs? Can you remember? Who was that? It was Solomon. And Solomon was whose son? Yes. It was David's son, wasn't he? And in the same way, the book of Ecclesiastes. So the first verse of Ecclesiastes says this. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So who's that? Well, it's Solomon. It's Solomon. And he refers to himself as the preacher. I wonder why he uses that. Well, it's because, you see, he has a message. A 
preacher is a person with a message. He's something to say that should make us think. And well, Solomon was coming with a message. He had a message from, if you like, from God. He's going to tell us, he's going to tell us um, all about some very important things indeed some people think the book of ecclesiastes really really hard and i suppose yeah in part it is but the basic message for the book of the book rather isn't so difficult because the book really is all about life it's about life life with god and life without god that's really what the book is about life with god and life without God. And it's almost as if half of the book tells us about life with God and half of the book tells us about life without God. That's what the book really is about. And part of that is that it's about happiness. Happiness. Now, hands up all who like to be happy. Samuel likes to be happy. Daniel likes to be happy. Does Mr. Blue Bunny like to be happy? Yes, he's got his hand up. That's good. We like to be happy. Is there anybody who likes to be unhappy? I'm just checking. I'm just looking around the room in case somebody is volunteering that they like to be unhappy. I'd be very surprised if anyone likes to be unhappy. But sometimes you get people and they're so full of moans and groans and complaints you could think that they actually like they we'd use the word grown-ups would use the word they relish being unhappy they like being unhappy you know i knew a lady once and she was always rather unhappy oh dear always rather unhappy and another lady i know said of her one day you know if she smiled her face would crack. What a statement, eh? If she, fa if she smiled, her face would crack. Wow, I've never forgotten what was said all those years ago. That lady seemed to be, you know, she seemed to like to be unhappy and she was always moaning and groaning and complaining. Well, Ecclesiastes is telling us about being happy and surely we all want to be happy, don't we? So it's a very important book to, to sort of understand and to get to grips with. And Ecclesiastes is really saying to us this, you'll only really be happy with God in your life. You'll only really be happy. You'll only really understand the meaning of life, what life is all about. You'll only really understand, you know, why the world is the way that it is and, and where we're going and what we're about and what's the meaning of life. You only really understand those things with God in your life. And the book has a very, very famous verse to begin with. It says this, vanity of vanities, all is vanity vanity of vanities all is vanity now that presents us with a problem this morning because the word vanity is one that you probably do not use hmm? i doubt if you use that word so you know the teenagers better be on alert here because you might get asked a question in a moment the word vanity sometimes grown-ups use the word vain vain okay and they speak of somebody being vain i wonder what that means vain and vanity are connected you see vain what does vain mean sometimes we use the word vain to describe someone who is always looking in the mirror did you do that this morning samuel did you look in the mirror no i bet mummy did it for you did mummy you know make sure your hair was neat and tidy before you came out yeah i'm sure she did what about that tie You've got a very smart tie on there this morning hope everybody can see that who put the tie on did you put the tie on no who did that your mum or your dad your dad did that 
pretty good going, isn't it, really? Hey, Daniel, did you comb your hair this morning? No? Who combed your hair? Oh, nobody! You woke up like that! Oh, well, I wish I could have hair like that, because if I... If I'd woken up this morning and come straight here, I'd look like Ken Dodd, you know. I'd sort of have hair everywhere. That's my hair. It takes a bit of, you know, sorting out. My hair does. It's just the way it is. Well, um... Blue Bunny, did you comb your own hair this morning, or did somebody else comb it? Mummy combed it, did she? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. Mummy combed it. That's the way it is, yeah. You see, vain, sometimes we use that word. Somebody goes to the mirror and they're busy making sure they're looking nice. And then they, they go away a couple of minutes and they come back again and they're looking again. And they want to make sure that they're all looking beautiful and smart. And sometimes we say that they're vain. They're rather anxious to look, you know, smart. And that they, they want everybody to notice them and so on. They're vain. And the word vain, I suppose, really, carries that idea of being a bit empty. You know, they're empty. It's all vanity. It's all a bit empty. Now, I'm not saying it's not nice to look, you know, smart, because it is. And I, it's great. Look at Samuel's tie there. Isn't it wonderful? Hmm? You better tell your dad that Mr. R said tie very... Oh, hair too, but, you know. And Daniel's looking very smart as well, but he didn't even need to do anything for his, so... That's just amazing, isn't it? Just amazing to look smart. Well, sometimes people can be vain. They want to hide their wrinkles, you know? They want to sort of make themselves out to be smarter than they are. The word vanity really means empty. It's like a puff of wind. It's empty. And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is saying. It's saying there's no meaning to life without God. Life is empty without God. If you haven't got God in your life, if you're not connected with God, life is empty. And to help us, Solomon has done a lot of experiments. Now, that's another word we're going to have to sort out before we can go any further. What's an experiment, Samuel? Do you know? Scientists do experiment. That's, yeah? Is that what you meant? Yeah, okay. Daniel, have you done any experiments in school yet? Oh, one or two. What have you done? Come on. Nothing big or anything yet. Oh, I used to love experiments. I used to do experiments in school, experiments in ho at home. Wires and bulbs and batteries and pieces of string and all these things. Great. There's one experiment we used to do in school. Auntie Heather's sitting there. She, she'll probably know this one. But in school, when I was there, we used to get let loose with Bunsen burners and that sort of thing, you know. It's kind of scary, really, when you think back. And there was gas at every desk. And uh, we were able to fill a can with gas. And you'd fill the can with gas. You put the lid on, you turn it upside down, and there was a hole in the top. And then you'd light a match, and a little flame would appear where the hole was, because the gas was coming out, you see? A bit like your gas fire or your... You know, your, your gas burner for cooking at home. And then suddenly, bang! And the top would fly off the can because the mixture beneath got to a place where it became just right and bang, it would go. I used to love that experiment in school. It was great. I even thought to bring an experiment this morning, but then I thought again. So I've left it. But experiments mean we try things out to see what works, to see how it works, to try and understand what is going on. And you know what? Solomon did a whole pile of experiments. Now, not with um, cans and gas or batteries and bulbs and things like that. He did experiments in life. This is what he tells us in chapter 2. 
I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. And what he's telling us is this, look, I, I'm telling you now, you don't need to try these things out because I've done the experiments. You don't need to do them for yourselves. I've done all the experiments. You know what? You can try whatever you like. You can try and find pleasure in whatever you like, but you're wasting your time. It's all vanity. And then he tells us about a whole series of different things that he did. He says, I said of laughter. Do we like to laugh? Like to laugh, Samuel? Yeah. Like to laugh, Daniel? Blue Bunny like to laugh, does he? Great. Great. We all sort of like to laugh, don't we? Well, Solomon, he, he tried laughter. I don't know what he made to laugh, but he tried laughter. But even though he had lots of laughter, he said, what does it accomplish? What does it accomplish? What has it achieved? What has it done for me? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees. I made water pools. I acquired male and female servants. I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. What Solomon is saying is, look, I tried all these things. I had houses and I had animals. I had servants. I had gardens. I had orchards. You name it, I've tried it, he says. But it didn't do me any good. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. But the trouble is, it was all vanity, verse 11, and grasping for the wind. Solomon was a rich man. Thankfully, you don't have to say to mum, mum, I think I would like to try a bigger house. Dad, I think I would like an orchard at the bottom of our garden. You know, mum, I think we should have servants. I think it would make us happy. Thankfully, Mummy and Daddy are not going to have to go to the bank to borrow a lot of money to help you because all those experiments have been done and they come to absolutely nothing because it all boils down, says Solomon, to vanity. It's all empty. You can try those things in life to make yourself happy and to give life a sense of purpose. You can try all of those things but they'll do nothing for you. They won't be the answer. They won't make you happy. They simply won't do the job. Because life will never be truly happy without God. You can see how close what Solomon is saying here in Ecclesiastes is to what he said in Proverbs. What did he say in Proverbs? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this is looking from a different angle, but it's really the same story. You can't have joy, you can't have delight, you won't have real happiness without God in your life. And then you know what? Right at the end of the book, Solomon speaks to young people, okay? So I suppose the book is for all sorts of people, but right at the end of the book, he speaks to young people. This is what he says. He says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. And so he's coming to the end of the book and he says, look, this is absolutely crucial. Remember your creator, remember God. Have God in your life. Have God important in your life. Remember your creator. Not when you're old. But when you're young. Remember him now. Says Solomon. Then he gives us a picture of what an older person looks like. Sometimes Mr. Blue Bunny. Mr. Blue Bunny sometimes likes to play a little game where he pretends to be a blind man. Now, I have no idea where this game has come from, okay? 
but he pretends to be a blind man with a stick and he walks around with his eyes shut like this pretend grander he says that i'm a blind man i'm an old man a blind man and he walks around and i have to walk along and grab his arm and keep him from falling over isn't that right mr blue bunny yep i know well solomon gives us a picture here of an old man this old man his legs are feeble he can't see very clearly he's all wobbly and he's frightened about going outside sometimes that happens for older people and they get frightened of going outside they're frightened of falling over Solomon says, don't leave it till you're an old, old person to remember God. Remember God now. Before you get wobbly and you can't see. And then he concludes like this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. <clears throat> whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because one day you're going to meet God as your judge. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And Solomon is saying, look, Fear God right through your life. That's the way to real happiness. Be careful to listen to what God says. Keep his commandments. Fear God. Because one day you're going to come face to face with him. You're going to have to give an answer. And even the secret things are going to come out. Whether they're good or bad. So be careful to fear God, to walk with God through your life now. It's quite similar, isn't it, in a way? Completely looking, you know, completely different looking book, Ecclesiastes. But in some ways, the message is the same. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Be careful to fear God now and to have God in your life. Be careful, says Solomon. Be careful as a young person. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Well, there we are. That's the book of Ecclesiastes. And we'll leave that one to one side. I'm going to read um, from the Bible. And I'm going to read from the book of Titus this morning for the last time. Titus and from chapter 3. So the book of Titus, Titus and chapter 3. And I'm going to read the whole of that chapter this morning. So Titus in chapter 3 and at verse 1, let us hear God's word. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped 
and sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And we thank God for the reading of his holy word. We're going to turn to God now in prayer. Let us seek God's face together in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving heavenly Father, we are so pleased to gather in your holy presence. We're so delighted with the return of the Lord's day and of this call that comes to us, to all the ends of, of the world, but comes to us perhaps especially as the people of God, that we may gather before you, that we may call upon your name, that we may seek your face. And we thank you, Lord, that we uh, still enjoy something in this land in which we live of the specialness of Sunday. And we thank you for this privilege, which is ours. And we pray, Lord, that as we gather today, that we may know your grace and mercy, your blessing and your love to be lavished upon us. Surely, Lord, this is a day that you have set apart and made special. For you made the world and all that therein is in the space of six days. And then on that seventh day, you rested, as it were. You declared complete all that you had made. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wonder of all that you have done. But especially, we thank you for the wonder of what you have done in sending your son, Jesus, into the world to be our saviour. We thank you for that wonderful change that took place from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And we thank you that we're able to say, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. And we thank you for the wonder of the gospel, which is ours this morning. And to know that we have Jesus Christ as our saviour. To know that we have a wonderful friend and one who has overcome death and sin. And one who delivers us from what we deserve in hell. To the wonderful blessing of heaven. We thank you for this wonderful saviour and friend. And we thank you that we have one that we can always trust. That though indeed perhaps our lives at times pass through difficult circumstance. And uh, things of perplexity. Yet we can know that our God reigns. Our God is on the throne. And that he's demonstrated his power and glory in sending his son. And that we're on the end of wonderful love out of the heart of the Father above. Help us, Heavenly Father, we pray that we may cling to our Lord Jesus Christ. That we may hold fast to him. That in days, O oh God, which are perhaps rather disorientating, days which are rather confusing. Days, Lord, when easily we could look around and wonder where is God. Yet, Heavenly Father, that we may be assured that our God does reign, that our God is on the throne, and that we may be comforted in knowing that our God does all things well. Draw near to us, we pray, on this a new Lord's Day then. And come and speak to our hearts, we pray. We know that more than anything else in life, we need to hear God. We need to listen to God. We need to ponder what God says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god and we pray lord give us a, an appetite give us a hunger give us a desire we pray that we may hear the words of god this morning that we may take them away that we may feed upon them in our hearts that we may grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ and that in the midst of this perplexing world of God, that we may have that manna from heaven that feeds us, that carries us through, that calms the heart, that helps us, Heavenly Father, to be assured that we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. And help us then, Heavenly Father, we pray, to lay hold upon the words of God in faith. 
We thank you for all that has come our way since last we met. And sometimes, Lord, there are deep perplexities there. But we know that God works all things together for good to them that love him. And help us, we pray, to believe and to trust and to know your wonderful care and to know that we're on the end of a love that will not let us go. We pray for those who can't gather with us today through different circumstances, whether they be not so well or whether it is, Heavenly Father, that troubles or difficulties have come. We don't know, but we commend them to your keeping care. And we ask you, O oh God, to enrich and to bless their lives and to do them good. We pray for those who will be able to gather with us this morning across the internet. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would remember them with loving kindness and that you would cause your face to shine upon them. Remember those who are just not so well today and those who are worried about loved ones and those perhaps who today are forced to care for loved ones. And we, we want to commend each and every one to you and to your grace and to your love and kindness. We want to pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us in the day and age in which we find ourselves. When life does feel somewhat oppressive, oh God, when there is a weight and a burden and a heaviness that falls upon us all, um, surely, oh God, your, your Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and surely between the persons of the Godhead there is wonderful fellowship, an eternal fellowship between the persons of God. And surely we're made in your image and likeness. And Lord, you've made us for fellowship too. And yet our present circumstances make all of this rather difficult. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, that though we feel the hardness and the difficulty of the day in which we find ourselves, that we too, Lord, may be able to draw upon you and that we would be enabled to make the most of what we do have and to value and treasure all the more the things that temporarily we trust that we've lost and that will in the fullness of time be restored to us. But help us, Heavenly Father, we pray, to value these things and to treasure. And help us, O oh God, we pray individually, to vow that we'll make the most of every opportunity when these things are returned to us. Lord, help us, we pray, to be careful and diligent, to make the most and to trust in our God and to know that our God has a purpose in all things. We do commend our land and nation to you. We do com commend, oh God, those who are busy in, in terms of health care. Some of our own number are missing here this morning because of health care issues. And we commit and commend them to you. And we pray, oh God, that you would bless them and remember them and do them good. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you remember our, our land and nation and our government. And we feel somewhat fraught about it all, oh God. We hear so many different things. We hardly know what to think. We hardly know what to believe. So many numbers, so many statements. Lord, help us, we pray, above all, to rest in the words of our God. And grant to those who have uh, leadership and authority over us that they may know your help. Help them, we pray, oh God, to humble themselves under the almighty hand of God. To know that the answer is not ultimately in man, but in God, who gives to man all the abilities that man subsequently has. Help us, we pray, Lord, as a people and as a nation, to know that we need to turn back to our God and to be wise and to make that turn. We pray your blessing upon this morning. We pray for this evening. We pray for our sister congregations. We pray for your word wherever it's delivered in faithfulness and truth this day. Scattered right around the globe. And for Christians who find themselves in great trouble and persecuted. And for Christians this morning who are sad. Remember them we pray heavenly father. We thank you for such a wonderful savior in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we can be assured that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, that he knows our feeble frame, that he remembers that we are but dust. And we pray, Lord, help us through today to be wise in drawing near to him, in knowing our own insufficiency, but in knowing our sufficiency of God. And help us to look, we pray, constantly to the Savior. Remember the children, we thank you for them. We pray your blessing upon them, O oh God. We pray that you would do them good. We pray that you would speak to their hearts and that you would lay those things up that we've spoken about there this morning. And that these, O oh God, in the fullness of time would yield fruit 
to your glory and praise and honor. Help us as parents, as grandparents, as those looking on, as uncles and aunts and all the rest of it, to play our part and to represent our Lord Jesus Christ well. And deal, we pray, not only with our hearts, but in the hearts of our children, remembering that you're the God of Abraham, but the God of Isaac, the God of Isaac, but the God of Jacob, the God of Jacob, but the God of Joseph. Lord, remember, we pray, our succeeding generations and come in blessing and grace and mercy as only you can hear our prayers this morning cleanse us from our many many sins open your word to our heart anew and afresh and cause your blessing to be upon us for we pray our prayers in the name of our lord jesus christ he who taught us to pray together saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good that we can all um, be gathered there this morning, and uh, one or two missing, but um, some uh, bugs and so on about, so we trust that everyone will soon be restored to the fullness of health and strength. Announcements, well, and we'll be in church there this evening, I won't forget that one this week since I forgot it last week, but we'll be in church there this evening, so if you can be there this evening, that would be really good. Uh, remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy, the commandment says. So let's be careful with God's day. Tuesday evening, we'll be there for Bible study and prayer meeting. Some will be upstairs, I'm sure, and others will be at home. And if you can join with us um, in whatever way, well, do join with us. God's people need to call upon him. Maybe you've never been a prayer meeting person. Uh, maybe prayer meetings is something that you've never sort of felt was your thing. Well, you should. You should. Um, thankfully, I can say that, um, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of my conversion, not just mine, but someone else sitting there this morning. Um, but it wasn't very long um, before I was dragged to the prayer meeting. Thank you for dragging me to the prayer meeting. And that's a wonderful discipline. It's a discipline that should belong to each and every one of us. The picture in Acts 2 and verse 42 is of the church meeting together to pray. It's unarguable. You can't argue with it. It's a waste of time. So do make the most of the opportunity to pray together. And then on uh, Friday evening, there's no seniors this week. We had a really good time in seniors. And thanks again to Stephen for doing the cleaning yesterday um, as the follow on, because I think we would have been rather tired and weary by the time we got to the end of the meeting on Friday evening, but Stephen very kindly volunteered to come and do that and did it yesterday. Thank you for that. Um, but do remember then children's meeting and juniors um, this coming Friday, and do remember to pray about those things. There were one or two things there in the little sheet that went out this morning. You should have received that electronically, and for those who didn't, there will be a piece of paper handed to you um, in due course. Um, part of that is to do with the way that we'll sing at the end of the service this morning. No more needs to be said. Please read the sheet. Um, the other one is to do with the young people's um, calendar. There is a sheet out there. I don't think anybody signed it there this morning. But if you do want extra copies of the young people's calendar, please make sure to sign it and quickly. Because that needs to go away. And we're on a fairly tight schedule there um, at the moment. I know I said two weeks' time. Well... It will be two weeks' time, but it's going to be a fairly tight schedule. So if you are wanting those calendars, please be quick to say. Now, there is due to be an office bearers prayer meeting tomorrow evening. That's to take place by Zoom. I'm assuming that a link will come out. I've seen no sign of the link yet, um, but I'm assuming a, a link will come out. And by hook or by crook, we'll make sure that link gets to you. If you've never used Zoom before... Um, I imagine most of the office bearers have. 
Zoom is pretty easy, really, because if you've got your, you've got the link on your phone, or if you've got the link on your tablet or whatever, all you need to do is just to hit the link. And whether you've got Zoom on board or not, it will get you sorted out. I don't know whether it's a visual Zoom. I won't be visual uh, myself, but uh, you can be visual if you, you want to be, but I'm not sure whether it's going to be a visual Zoom or simply in sound. But anyway, that's supposed to take place at 7.30 tomorrow evening. So those, I think, are all the announcements, and we trust that we'll know God's blessing there this morning and again this evening. I'm going to read from a psalm. It should come up now. It's Psalm uh, 77. Psalm 77. It's one that we do um, sing on a fairly regular basis, and I'm reading at verse 1 and down to verse 10. I cried aloud to God for help. I prayed that God would hear. When I was plunged in deep distress, I sought the Lord in prayer. At night, I stretched untiring hands. Relief my soul refused. Remembering you, O God, I groaned with longing as I mused. In my distress, I could not speak. From sleep, you kept my eye. I thought about the former days, the years which have gone by. Throughout the watches of the night, my songs I called to mind. I pondered deeply while my heart an answer tried to find. Forever will the Lord reject and never show his grace. Has he withdrawn his steadfast love and turned from me his face? For all time has his promise failed. Is God no longer kind? Has he in his great wrath dismissed compassion from his mind? Then to my heart there came this thought. On this I will rely. The years of the right hand of power of him who is most high. And I trust that we'll think about those words carefully and be reminded that God is there, that God hasn't changed, that God is on his throne. Paul is writing to Titus and we've been some uh, weeks, months looking through this book. He's writing to Titus, who would appear to be a younger minister. He's left in Crete. He's ministering to the church. The church is, we're not sure, in Crete. Crete was not an easy assignment. It wasn't an easy place to be. And evidently, there were cultural sins that belonged to Crete. And so the sins of Northern Ireland might not be the sins of Crete, and the sins of Crete might not be the sins of Northern Ireland in terms of, you know, what we might refer to as cultural sins. In Crete, there was a a clear predisposition to lie. The Cretans are always liars, Paul says. It's a very strong statement, isn't it? But evidently there was some cultural sin that nullified the, the wrong and the hurt of uh, lies in their, their minds. And, and Titus is left with the task of sorting some very difficult situations out. The eldership, he needed to sort the eldership out. But the people, older men, older women, younger men, people who were bond servants, Christians in general. And he's to speak boldly. He'd been called to be a minister of the gospel and his task was not to sort of pussyfoot around the place in the sense of, you know, never saying anything. He was to be strong for his God. And he's to remind them especially of the wonder of salvation and of what God has done in their lives. And of the consequence then that needed to be in terms of living for God. And this term that perhaps to an extent we automatically shy away from good works. And we've seen the importance of that term in the book of Titus. And right at the end, we'll actually touch that string very gently again there this morning. We've seen in the last two weeks that Titus is to watch out for people who would cause trouble. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Three strikes and it's out, says Paul. Knowing that such a person is warped. We noticed last week the perfect tense. He's having been warped. You're not going to get him out of shape. 
You're not going to get him, you know, back into shape. And he's sinning, present tense. He's ongoingly doing wrong. Being self-condemned. Now, we come to the um, end of the book there this morning. And Paul has a number of different things to say. And I'm going to pick up three little strings there this morning. The first is to do with busyness. The second is to do with usefulness. And the third is to do with fruitfulness. Okay, so three little strings. The busyness, so irrefutable. Paul will um, make reference here to his own busyness. And we'll think about that for a minute or two. We can't argue about that. Paul was some worker. Paul was some worker. The busyness, so irrefutable. You've always to respect that, haven't you? You've got somebody who works hard. You be careful to respect them. The busyness, so irrefutable. The usefulness, so commendable. He'll mention one or two of his um, fellow workers. And we'll just reflect very quickly upon their usefulness. And how they're remembered in Holy Scripture. And how God remembers our usefulness too. The usefulness, so commendable. And then we'll come back to that all-important note that runs all the way through the book of Titus. And we'll speak again very quickly of the fruitfulness. The fruitfulness so desirable. That's what the book has been about. In some senses, Titus is unique. There are other books that mention the sort of theme of fruitfulness. But in Titus, it's kind of the note that runs all the way through. And in that sense, it's unique. The fruitfulness so desirable. So those three headings then. The busyness so irrefutable. The fruitful, the usefulness rather so um, commendable. And the fruitfulness so desirable. Let's begin by talking about the busyness so irrefutable. I don't know if you feel you're busy or not. I'm very conscious that the whole virus thing has brought about a busyness for some and um, not for others. Some parents have been very, very busy with school work, and I've remarked upon this many times because I think it's important that we support them in our prayers. It's not easy. But some parents have been very, very busy with school work that needed to be supervised, and that's not an easy task. Some folk have been working, um, you know, horrendous hours from home. Um, and it's not easy if you're a home worker sometimes to switch off. It's not easy if you're a home worker to know where to draw the line. And start and stop can be blurred. But some of our folk have been working, you know, bordering on horrendous hours and at home. And it brings enormous pressure. Some folk have had family and neighbours to worry about. Some folk have seen their pattern of work turned completely upside down. And it's wonderful that they're still standing on two legs. Someone has said that busyness is a tricky state of mind. It's like getting caught in quicksand. The more you try to escape, the more you get sucked down. I think that's a very helpful illustration myself. That busyness is a tricky state of mind. It's like getting caught in quicksand. Think about it. The more you try to escape, the more you get sucked down. There's something in that. There's something in that. Busyness can be a problem. But of course, in many, many ways, we see busyness, I trust, <laughs> as something positive. Something positive. Think of uh, Matthew's gospel, the words of the Lord Jesus and Matthew and um, in, uh, towards the end, really, of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew in chapter 24 and reading there at verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler 
over all his goods. And here's the picture of someone who is busy. He's busy in relation to the kingdom of God. Yes, but he's busy. And busy, evidently there, is cast as something positive. This person was, you know, busy in relation to the kingdom of God. He was a, a servant busy for his Lord. The Lord Jesus there is, is talking about that. He's talking in the context of the second coming. And he, he's saying, isn't he? Look, be busy in your life for God. You don't know when he's going to come back, when the Savior is coming back. Be busy in your life for God. And these verses, verses 12 to 15, here at the end of Titus and Titus in chapter 3, um, spell out for us surely an apostle who was very busy. He was a very busy man. Now, Titus is a short letter, and in many, many ways, it has a singular theme. There are, um, you know, related themes, but the, the singular theme, really, of the book is the grace and the godliness of the gospel. And the support, then, that Titus was to, to, to be to the church in Crete, he was to ordain men who would uphold that stand, and he was to silence others, and he was to keep yet others from seeking to gather followers. But notice this morning at the end of the book that on a whole long list of matters that are on Paul's mind, it's very clear to us that Paul was busy. Titus had been left in Crete for this reason, verse 5 of chapter 1, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Things were being left for Titus to do, but Paul himself was exceeding busy. He couldn't do everything. He couldn't be everywhere. That says something to us in and of itself, isn't it? You can't expect, you know, everything to be done for you. You have to help in church life. But notice that with all of that, Paul now intends that they meet up in Nicopolis. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, who presumably was going to be a stand-in for a few weeks or something, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I decided to spend the winter there. How do you keep your diary? I, I don't know. How do you keep your diary? Do you keep it in a book? Do you, you know, looking forward to getting a new diary at Christmas? Or do you have a wall chart at home? Or do you just remember all these things? I do a certain amount of that. Or do you put things on your phone? Or have you got some other gadget that you use for your diary? Paul evidently had some diary. It wasn't easy. We think, you know, our diaries have been rocked the last months. Well, I would suggest to you that it was far harder to keep Paul's diary. What's clear about the man is that he was exceedingly busy. Acts in chapter 9 and at verse 15, we read that Paul was appointed to this task. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear the name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Evidently, God intended that Paul would be busy. And Paul was a worker, not a shirker, no question about that. He was a hard worker. Paul threw himself into it. He was busy night and day, wasn't he? No question about that. And there are a number of passages that point that out to us. So First Thessalonians, and um, if I can turn this up quickly enough, First Thessalonians and uh, chapter 2. Verse 9, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a, a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Paul was actually self-supporting. He made tents, didn't he? It wasn't that he were, you know, was without entitlement to support. He speaks of that in some detail in 1 Corinthians and chapter 9. He was entitled to support. But he didn't take it because he felt that people would misuse the fact that he was taking it. And he supported himself. He worked night and day. He was a very busy man. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 8 nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you this man was a worker you know he was a worker there's no way that Paul was a shirker he was a worker he worked hard we mentioned the book of Proverbs with the children well of course famously in Proverbs 6 you'll probably know this verse and at verse 6 we read there go to the ant you sluggard consider her ways and be wise and the message is you know don't be lazy don't be laying about don't be squandering your life look at the ant they're always on the move they're always busy they're always doing something of course we don't like it when they start getting in the house and all that sort of stuff but they're always busy they're always on the move Paul writes in the book of Romans and in chapter 12 and he writes in this way at verse 10 be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit serving the Lord and evidently the Christians in Rome and he's not addressing the leaders he's addressing all the Christians in Rome and he's saying, look, you, you need to, to, to be busy for God. You need to be active for God. And the lesson, it seems to me, at the end of the book is that here's Paul. And he's not in, you know, in Crete. Titus is there doing that work. But Paul wants Titus to be busy. And we mustn't think that Paul is sitting there folding his arms and just having an easy time and thinking, well, Titus is there and Timothy's there and, and so on. And Tychicus, yes, he can work hard. Paul himself was an extremely busy man. Reminds us that we need to make the most of our lives, of our opportunities, of our gospel opportunities, of our Christian opportunities, of our church opportunities. We need to make the most. That message there to the children this morning, you know, remember your creator in the days of your youth. There is a danger that we can think, well, when I'm old and retired, I can give some time to God then. But now I'm too busy. That is a real danger, isn't it? A real danger. We need to make the most of our lives for God. We need to make the most of what God has given us. We're going to have to answer. We're all going to appear before the judge. We're reminded again. We've seen a number of passages like that recently. They all agree, they all tally. We're all going to give an account, aren't we? The Lord Jesus, and in John and chapter 9 and verse 4 says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming, <clears throat> sorry, when no one can work. Notice, you know, lots of work going on there in the town by the, the Danska Bank, almost said the Northern, but the Danska Bank, and they were doing something with pipes. I was having a look. Mr. Blue Bunny, I think, inspected the work, and the builders stopped for him so that he could have a peep. But anyway, um, but wow, they had some fantastic lights up there. Did you see them? Oh, it's like daylight. But in general terms, it's harder to get things done at night, isn't it? And the Lord Jesus says, make the most of the opportunities whilst you've got them. Because those times may go, those opportunities may flit. John in chapter 4, verse 31. The disciples urged Jesus, saying, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. The disciples reasoned amongst themselves. Has somebody given him something to eat? It's, it's lovely that they were concerned about um, his being fed. But Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Paul was a hard worker. He was a worker, not a shirker. He worked hard for the cause of God. 
The scripture reminds us, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Don't give to God what is left over. Don't give to God what is left over. Give God the best. In the Old Testament, there was that principle of the first fruits. It was the first fruits. God didn't want what was left over. It was the first fruits. That's the principle, isn't it? The first fruits. The busyness... So irrefutable. You can't argue with that this morning. You're wasting your time. The usefulness, secondly, so commendable. There's no doubting that Paul himself was very useful. But there are others listed here, um, apart from the man that we've been thinking so much about, Titus. Look at the um, list of fellow workers that Paul mentions here. There's this fellow Artemis and Tychicus. There's Zenos the lawyer. There's Apollos and so on. And, and this is just one example of this kind of list. You'll find lists like this in Romans and Colossians and in uh, 2 Timothy. And these are Paul's fellow workers. They're people with whom Paul has an involvement in the gospel. It's wonderful, isn't it, that he kept in touch with so many. And in an a, you know, a day and age when it wasn't easy to keep in touch we have so many different means to keep in touch i don't know if you feel you're good at keeping in touch or not i'm not sure whether i think i'm good or bad really to be honest with you i did shoot off two quick um, emails to friends there last night just as i was finishing off my work there for today and i'm not a bad texter though don't be too impatient if you don't get one back but anyway that's the way these things work isn't it you know but paul was brilliant it seems at keeping in touch with so many he, he talks about meeting up in nicopolis if you and i had to meet someone well there's the car filling that i suppose the bus could catch the train need your mask on of course Got the phone, not a big phone person myself, but got the phone, text message, I'm happy with those, email, you guys do WhatsApp, I do my best to keep away from it. All these different things, all these different means of keeping in touch. In many ways, by comparison, our day is so much easier so if you've got friends and family in trouble it's not hard to keep in touch is it it's not hard to keep in touch the danger of course with all of those things is that they sort of overwhelm us the more gadgets you've got the more demanding they become isn't that right they do they do but what um busyness paul knew and wonderfully what usefulness he can speak of when he talks about others too think about those fellow workers for a moment or two there's apollos we know about apollos from acts and chapter 18 he was extremely well versed in the scripture and he seems to have been a very powerful preacher we're told this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. His understanding wasn't perfect, but he was a powerful speaker. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when, an Aquila, when rather Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately and so on. But he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly. He was some speaker. That's Apollos at the end of Acts and chapter um, 18. He's mentioned again in Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 3. There's another fellow here. He's called Tychicus. I'm not sure about that name, but 
But anyway, he's called uh, Tychicus. He's mentioned in the book of um, Ephesians and in chapter 6, right at the end there. But that you may also know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. He's mentioned also in the book of Colossians, but I won't go through all these references this morning. And there are others mentioned, and others mentioned in different places. And what part they all played. But they all played a part. They're obviously well thought of. And they remembered in scripture. And I want to emphasize that. Wednesday was Remembrance Day. We remember those who fell in war on our behalf. Here are people who are remembered. And I want to remind you, you know, you say, well, I'm not a Paul and I'm not a Titus. No, but you might be a Tychicus or an Artemis or a Zenus. And I want to remind you that God remembers. God remembers, doesn't he? Not all these figures are a Paul, but God remembers. There's a wonderful verse that we will come to, God willing, maybe, I don't know, maybe after Christmas in Bible study in Hebrews, we'll see. Um, but we read there in Hebrews 6 and verse 10, these words. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. It's there in Hebrews 6 and verse 10. God is not unjust to forget. It's possible to do that, isn't it? You know, and someone has done something really wonderful for us in the past. They've always been there for us. They've been a brick. They've always been there to help us. We've always been able to rely upon them. But time has slipped by. We've forgotten. We've forgotten all they've done. We don't value it. We don't treasure it. We've forgotten. We've forgotten. God doesn't forget. Wonderful that, isn't it? It's a great encouragement to us. You see, it's a great encouragement to us. Play your part, whatever that can be, in the work of the gospel, in the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Play your part, do what you can do. Don't try and do something that you're not fitted for doing. Don't try and push yourself on in the wrong way. That's not a great idea. But whatever it is that God gives you to do, make sure to be faithful in playing your part. I always find it you know find it quite stunning. Um, This passage tends to get well. I suppose it won't get read this year at the carol service in the high school. I wouldn't think, maybe, but it it gets read um, normally in the high school carol service there, and it's from the end of Matthew in chapter twenty-five. And you read at verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And it's the king. And everybody's before the king. And the king is looking at what people have done. And the king remembers something that was done. And the people of God don't remember. When did we do that? When did we do anything for you? They've forgotten. But the king hasn't forgotten. It's very powerful, that, isn't it? Powerful, stunning. Eh? Powerful, stunning. The busyness so irrefutable, the usefulness so commendable. But let me go back then to the main theme. And I'm not going to hit this note very hard here this morning, but I am going to touch the note and just let us hear it for a moment. Let me speak about the fruitfulness so desirable. Notice that in verse 14 then, we return to that theme of good works. And let our people 
also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. We've seen good works in the broad sense. Here perhaps it's coming close to, you know, helping others in some way or other. But still, it's there in that broad sense right throughout the book. And the book, as I've said many times, is about the truth according to godliness. That's what you've got in verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. That is the key to the book. That little phrase is the key to the book. Take hold of the key, you understand what the book is about. Back in 1984, at the Banner of Truth conference um, in Leicester, there was a speaker, the Reverend Albert N. Martin. Some of us value his ministry enormously. He's now a much, much older and much, much frailer gentleman, well into his 80s now. Um, he comes from America, very powerful speaker, and so on. Now a much older gentleman. And he addressed, in a sort of glancing way, really, the book of Titus. And he did so with his two um, almost inimitable uh, kind of headings. Mr. Martin is known for his, if you think my headings are, well... Mr. Martin's headings are about three times longer than anything that I ever produced, so you're talking about something quite different um, indeed. But he spoke of truth, the mother of godliness, and godliness, the child of truth. I was there, never forgotten. Truth, the mother of godliness, Godliness, the child of truth. And here's Paul now returning to that theme. It's been the theme of this book from start to finish. Here it is again. That's why I'm just plucking the note very gently this morning. That those who are ours, he says, maintain good works. Good works we've seen again and again were to be part of their lives. Here the word that he uses that our people also learn to maintain good works, to let good works rule, if that's the word that he uses here. Make sure that good works rule. There are things that can rule and ruin our lives. But these people were to be marked out by good things. Our lives, says Paul, are to be so ordered that good works are to be the order of the day. We use that phrase, don't we? I don't know whether the younger generation uses that phrase, but the older generation uses that phrase. And we talk about something being the order of the day. Good works are to be the order of the day, says Paul. Our people were to be fruitful, not fruitless. And it was to apply to every area of life. And we've seen that in the book of Titus. So we've... We haven't labored it, I haven't labored it, but Paul has labored it. Paul has labored it. Good works were to be here and to be clear in their lives. Good works were to filter out of every pore. If you like, good works were to be their sweat. They're to emanate from every part and fiber of their being. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, grace is the root. Good deeds are the fruit. It's nice, isn't it? Grace is the root. Good deeds are the fruit. I don't know if you've put your Christmas tree up. We have. We decided that we're little people about the place. 
There's a lot of other things we couldn't do for them this year. We like to take them to get a burger at the market and we like to take them to do this and to do that. Those things doesn't, doesn't look as though it's going to be happening this year, so we've gone the other way. You're going to think we're mad. We've got the Christmas tree up. With all the bits and bobs. With all the bits and bobs. It's up. All those plastic bits and bobs, all those metal bits and bobs, all those wooden bits and bobs. Paul isn't looking for bits and bobs. He's looking for real, genuine, simple, straightforward fruit. And he says, where there's real grace, there's real fruit. Not plastic bits and bobs, not things that are tied on to impress people. Where there's real grace, there's real fruit. He writes in Galatians, and he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. We've spoken of busyness this morning, of usefulness, but the note I want to leave you with is the note of fruitfulness. The fruitfulness of God, of good works, and the message of Titus that God longs for fruitfulness. He's not looking for plastic bits and bobs or, or wooden ones. He's not looking for shiny things. He's simply looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Love for God that responds to his commandments and lives a life for God. We're going to sing. It's the hymn 150. You will have read, I trust, the little instructions sent out there this morning, please. There are a number of devices around the room. You've seen one of them go off just now. But there are a series of devices there around the room to catch the sound there this morning. So we need to keep the singing sweet. We need to be really sweet this morning. Please don't sing too loud. Just sing sweetly and in harmony. And hopefully that recording will be very useful then at some point in the future. 150. The race that long in darkness pined has seen a glorious light. The people dwell in day who dwelt in death surrounding night 150 Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we 
Thank you for Paul's letter to Titus. We thank you for the wonderful reminder of your grace in salvation and for wonderfully working in our lives and for bringing us out of darkness and into your most marvellous light. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we may show forth the praise of him who brought us out of darkness, that we may show forth the graces of God in our lives, that we may demonstrate, O oh God, real gospel fruitfulness day by day by day. We pray, seeking your blessing as we part, in Jesus' name. Amen.